Good morning, brothers and sisters. Let's begin our worship today by reading Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Father God, we come here today shouting joyfully because you are our God. Greater. 
I'll know it well A melody that's never failed On mountains high In valleys low My soul will rest my confidence in you alone Hope has a name His name is Jesus my Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name, his name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised, I have victory. There is a light, salvation. Sun defeated, trampled the rain. See now the cross be lifted high. The light has come, the light has won. Behold the cry. Hope has a name, his name is Jesus. My Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name, his name is Jesus. Oh, Christ be praised, I have victory. There'll be a day, my hope complete. Now home in glory, your face I'll see. No pain no more, my fear will cease. I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ my King. I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ my King. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus, my Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has a name, His name is Jesus, oh Christ be praised, I have victory. Come on, hope, hope, hope has a name. Father God, we just thank you and praise you that we can come together and worship you joyfully with full confidence knowing that you are our God and you are in control. Father God, I want to pray today for some folks who are ill, who are connected with our church. Lord, we want to pray for Winnie Moe. I thank you, God, that you've been helping her and encouraging her and strengthening her. And I pray, God, you'll continue to do that at this time. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done with Helen. And, and I thank you, Lord, for the encouragement you've been to her and the way so many people have reached out and prayed for her and spoken with her. We thank you for the encouragement that you've been for her and Elisa as they continue to walk by faith, trusting you. And Lord God, our brother Alex is with you today. And we pray, God, for his family, that you would encourage them as they have faced this very, very difficult time these last few weeks. And they still have a road ahead. We pray, God, that we'll be able to support them and encourage them in any way that we possibly can, Lord. Father God, I want to pray for our brothers and sisters who are out of work today. Lord, it's a, it's a challenging time. It's a frightening time. And I pray, God, that you will show them that we are here for them and that you are there for them. And I pray, God, that if they have need, that they will, needs, they will come to us so that we can help them and encourage them today. 
Lord, we pray for the leaders in our church and we pray for leaders in our country. There are so many decisions that have to be made. And I pray, God, that, that men and women will turn to you for wisdom and guidance and not trust themselves. I pray, Lord, for the police officers in our church. And I, I thank you for these men of God who are serving faithfully. I know, Lord, it can be daunting as, as there's been such controversy around the role of police officers. But, Lord, these are men of God who are there to serve you. And I pray, God, that they will know that we are here for them. We are praying for them. We are supporting them. Lord God, we want to pray for what's going on in Lebanon today. This is something beyond our comprehension, something beyond our control, beyond our understanding. So much suffering. Lord, we feel like we need to do something. At this point, we pray and we trust and we believe. Just as we have been praying for months about so many things, we pray, we trust, and we believe. And we put them in your hands and show us, Lord, if there's something more that we need to do as a Beyond Walls Church to support them more effectively in this, life, in this situation today. Father God, I want to pray for our families that are pondering and debating and wondering about what to do with their children in school. They should send them back, keep them at home, how they're going to balance work and children. Lord, it's a, it's a daunting, ta- daunting time for them. Give them wisdom. Help us to support them in any way that we possibly can. And Lord, we want to pray for our teachers. These men and women who have faithfully served and helped and, and given of themselves to bring an education to the young people of today. Lord, many of them are afraid. And I pray, God, you'll give them wisdom as they decide what they need to do. Give them comfort as they seek to follow you each day in the challenges that they have. Father God, I want to pray for our our service today, Lord, is in our faith as a, as, a, as a congregation, Lord, as we face the, the, the attacks of Satan. Lord, you are greater than Satan. Help us to remember that. Help us to turn to you when he casts doubt and discouragement into our minds. Father God, as we think today about salvation, the salvation that we have in Christ, Lord, let it give us confidence that we can fully trust you. And Lord God, I pray that as a Beyond Walls Church, as we think about salvation, make us bold to share the hope of Christ with this world. Let us share with our family and friends. I pray, God, that because of the testimony that you've given us, that many will accept Jesus Christ as Savior. I pray this believing in your name. Amen. Good morning, OCM. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. May God bless the hearing and reading of his word. Thank you, Ava, for sharing the scripture with us this morning. Have you ever really wanted something so bad that you could not stop thinking about it? You know, when I was a kid, I really, really wanted a horse. That is one of the reasons that I drew this charcoal drawing that's behind me every Sunday. Is I loved horses. I had a, a chalk drawing that I drew from my grandfather of some horses in the field. I, I loved horses. I had horse figures all around my, uh, my home when I was a kid. I had a whole collection of, of horse figures that uh, were very special to me. I always really wanted a horse. I used to spend some, a lot of time at the, at the Iowa State Fair where they used to have a, well, they still do have a racetrack for, and, the, and they would have horses there. And I would go to the barns just to see the horses, just to watch them. I really, really wanted a horse. I enjoyed horses so much. But you know what? I never was able to have a horse. You know, it's, they're not cheap. They're expensive. When you live in a city, keeping and maintaining and taking care of a horse is a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of effort. So I never was able to have a horse. You know, 
the question is, would I have been happier if I had had a horse? I, I honestly don't know. I don't know. There are so many things that we want to have in life that, that we think we, in order, we must be had in order to be happy and, and content in our lives. Can you imagine what it would be like to have a gift that would make you totally and happy and content for the rest of your life? When I was a kid, I thought that'd be a horse. But you know what? We do have something today. We're going to talk about this is salvation. Salvation is a vital part of our protection from the attack. Salvation fulfills, fulfills all that we have ever wanted or desired, all that we could ever want. But we have to put on the helmet. Paul tells us in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. As we look at this verse, we need to remember what we looked at last week when Paul was talking about the whole armor of God. We need to have all of the pieces. He said in verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Paul says the full armor. We cannot go into battle without every piece of the armor, without the perception of truth, the passion for righteousness, the persistence of peace, and the protection of faith. Why? We're under attack. We are under attack, and we need the full armor of God. Verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. My friends, we are under a daily, unpretentious, unexpected, unstoppable attack. Satan wants us to doubt and reject God. 1 Timothy 5.15 says, For some of you have already turned aside to follow Satan. And this is one of the greatest fears we have for our brothers and sisters. So we don't become discouraged or distracted and turn aside and follow the ways of Satan in this world today. The attack is, is to cause us to doubt and reject God. Have you ever come to a point where the answers from Scripture are just not sufficient? Watch out. The arrows are coming. Have you ever been on a, were you under attack this past week? Have you had the opportunity to pick up the shield of faith? Have you had the opportunity to plant your shield next to a brother or sister to encourage them or to be encouraged? Have, have you had truth and, and right and peace? Have they helped you in your walk this past week? Have you been under attack? Keep those conversations going. Go back and review those discussions that we have had these past few weeks. And then we come to verse 17. It says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Take the helmet of salvation. I mentioned before, that Paul uses, uses, excuse me, uses unique words of actions for every piece of armor. He tells us to take up the armor and to take up the shield of faith. We are to take it and, and to, to make use of it, make use of the armor, make use of the faith. He tells us to buckle on truth. We're to, to buckle it around our bodies, to, to attach everything together. Everything in life is based on truth. He tells us to put on righteousness, the breastplate, put on the righteousness like clothing. We've got to clothe ourselves in what is right and understand what is right and wrong in our world today. He tells us to attach peace to our feet. We are to be walking forward forward to bring peace into this world. It's all part of the armor of God that we have. And today he tells us to receive the helmet of salvation. This word means to, to reach out and, and receive this very special gift and keep it. You know, this is an inter there's an interesting thing about a gift. You have to receive it. You have to take it. You know, I've had the privilege of performing around 40 or up to 40 weddings since I was ordained about 10 years ago. And one of the things I really enjoy about premarital counseling is hearing the story of the proposal. Now, there are some very, very creative proposals that I've heard about. You know, what tends to be common, though, is that, is that 
in most of those proposals, those who are proposing are fairly confident, fairly confident that the person they're asking will say yes. They will, that they will accept the ring and hopefully be happy. I don't often talk to couples where someone has gone out to find a random person off the street to propose marriage, offer a ring, hoping that they will be accepted. For the proposal to have results, obviously it has to be accepted. We want it to be accepted. Folks, we are the bride of Christ. He has died for us. He has offered us this incredible gift of salvation, but we have to receive it. We have to accept it. We have to take it. We have to treasure it. And what I've also learned about marriage is that the success is not just accepting, it is work. It is taking that proposal and each person doing their part. What is a blessing? about the gift of salvation is that it is unlike human marriage because Jesus will always do his part. Jesus will always do his part. But, you know, the question is, will we receive salvation and what will we do with it? Will we receive it and what will we do with it? But, but what is so special about salvation for my daily life? You know, what relevance does salvation have in a pandemic other than the assurance of eternal life in case I get sick and die? What about the attack of Satan is warded off by the helmet of salvation? You know, if, if, Paul, if Paul had in mind the Roman helmet, it may have looked something like this helmet. It was, you know, probably made out of bronze and it protected the head the place of thought, the, the source of our decisions of life. You can lose an arm and still live on. If you get your head seriously injured, then you are incapable of continuing the fight. In ancient times, actually the helmet was carried until it was time for the battle. Then it would be put on. It is pretty useless if it's not put on the head. You know, salvation addresses this very innermost parts of our life, our deepest thoughts and desires that are buried in the inner thoughts of our life. This is a key place for Satan to attack. So the question is, how does salvation protect us? Is it special to me? We believe that if we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, then we will have eternal life. I am sure that those who are Christians are happy with that part of the discussion. Who wants to go to hell? Not many people that I've spoken to. Now, that is fine for our Sunday morning sermon, but what does it mean on Monday? What does it mean when I have lost purpose? What does it mean when I have trouble finding the words to answer the complex questions of life? How does eternal salvation give me life? and protection from the spiritual attacks that we see each day. The question that we must answer first is, what am I being saved from? It is a little tough to accept something if I do not understand the need. The whole discussion of this centers around this body because, because of my bodily rejection of God, I am facing eternal separation from God. Paul develops this discussion in Romans chapter 3. Paul points out the core truth that, that people do not naturally understand God. Humanity has rejected God, starting with Adam and Eve, who decided to follow the temptation, the, the attack of Satan, by rejecting God's purpose for them in the garden. They decided that there, there must be something more than what God had promised. They decided that God's promises and creation were not enough. They decided that they had to find something more. And in looking for something more, they lost it all. This has continued throughout history as humanity continues to look for something more than what God has promised. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one righteousness, one person. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. 
Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned. None of us are exempt in this rejection. It all comes back to this body, to our desires. Adam and Eve and their human desires rejected God. The consequences were separation from Eden, from the full goodness and the creation of God, from God Himself. They faced eternal separation from God. This is the simple reality we see in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, where it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Humanity has continued in the example of Adam by rejecting God. We all have sinned. You ask me, can I prove this to you? My, my response is, open your eyes and look around you. Are there glimpses of light in this world? Yes, there are acts of kindness. There are people wanting to help other people. We keep hoping that somehow humanity will somehow collectively figure it out, that we cannot keep destroying each other in this world today. But I see the glimpses of light grossly overpowered by the darkness. And I want to declare to you today, from the depths of my soul, that I am full of of hope. I am not in despair. Not because of humanity. Not because of a vaccine. Not because of a politician. Not because of, of uh, collectively what people can do. I am full of hope. Why? Because of Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The ultimate result of rejecting God's Eden is eternal death. But he, and he says, and, but there is hope because of Jesus Christ. He says it differently in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. There is hope. We are, we are living in death, which is the rejection of God. Death leads to death. Christ, through His death, has puni was punished for our sinful rejection of God. And if we accept this gift, this proposal, we will become His bride. We will have life eternal. We can begin to live life beginning now and through eternity. You ask me, can I prove this to you? I have new life. I do not fear death. I have seen thousands who have new life. They do not fear death. That is my proof to you. We need to remember the question that I asked earlier. How does salvation protect us? Salvation protects us from eternal punishment. I have eternal life. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. The gift is there. We have to accept it. And we have the salvation through Jesus Christ. Romans 10.9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. We take the helmet of salvation we put it on our head. We realize our need because our sinful body has rejected God and is dying, facing eternal separation from God. When I accept and receive the gift of Jesus Christ that He has, that, that He has, He was punished for us, for my sinful rejection, I will have eternal salvation, eternal protection. I take the helmet, I go into battle, I put it on my head. So the question is, the question is, how does, that's fine, that's for the future, that's eternal, okay, I understand that. But then, how does salvation protect us today? How does it protect us today? There, there has to be more than just getting through this life and then being saved for eternity. That, that would be like living life, waiting for retirement to enjoy your life. That's not, it's not too exciting to me. I want to enjoy life now. Salvation begins 
now. Now. Now let's look back at that word salvation. This Greek word for salvation is used 46 times in the New Testament in talking about deliverance from eternal separation from God. Five of those times focus on salvation given to us from the Deliverer, Jesus Christ. The helmet of salvation is given to us by our Deliverer, Jesus Christ, so that when we die, we will be with God for eternity. When we are fully free from this body, we will never be separated from God. The helmet of salvation is given to us so that we will be delivered from the control of this body while we are physically separated from God. That deliverance begins now. We are free from being controlled from this body while we live and when we die. If salvation, salvation has to be eternal. It has to be eternal and it has to be temporal. If salvation was only temporal, then I would fear death, which I do not. If salvation was only eternal, then I would live hopelessly in this world, which I do not. This is exactly what Paul meant in Philippians 1.21. He says, for me to live is Christ and, and to die is gain. Every walk, waking moment that I am on this world, I have the opportunity to live the temporal salvation freed from human temptations and control. When I leave this world, I will have eternity with God. My friends, I live today for both. You cannot just accept the eternal salvation of God and ignore the temporal salvation of God. Take the helmet of salvation, put it on your head now. We are in the battle. We need that protection now. And take the helmet of salvation. And take the helmet of salvation. Salvation protects us from eternal punishment. And salvation protects us from ourselves. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Now. We have it now. We are freed from the control of this body. Ezekiel 37, 23 says that God is going to save us from ourselves, our own sinfulness. It says they will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any, uh, uh, any of their offenses. For I will save them from all their sinful backsliding. I will cleanse them. They will be my people and I will be their God. Salvation gives me the, an eternal perspective and it frees me from living under the control of my sinful body. When I decide to look at the world through the lens of salvation of God, I am presented with options that I do not have without salvation. I have to decide which lens I am going to use. Am I going to receive the helmet and put it on my head to protect my mind? Or am I going to hold it on my side thinking that I can throw it on later? Am I going to do it now or later? The, the, the attack is now. This is what Christ was teaching in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 to 24. He says, The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light with, within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either, either you'll hate one, the one, and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. My friends, this example of money is so pertinent to us today. Money will always be a part of temporal life. The simple question is, will the excess or the lack of money define your life? Some have great abilities to earn large sums of money. That is not evil. 
Some do not have the abilities to earn excessive amounts of money. That is not a deficiency. The attacks come with how we gain the money, why do we gain the money, and what do we do with that money. Christ died to save us from ourselves. Maybe we need to have a, a few less investments in the world's financial systems and a few more investments in God's eternal salvation. I have been told by some that if our brothers and sisters follow this teaching that I share, uh, they may earn less money. They may have to stop working so hard or so much so, so they can focus on maybe teaching or sharing Christ or spending time with their kids, but they need to earn their money. They say the church may not have enough money to pay my salary. I've been told that before. My response is that if my brothers and sisters need to earn less money in order to have a full realization of their salvation, then I say, praise God. They are earning less money. Praise God. I will keep preaching. I will get a job and, and support my family as God provides. My greatest concern, my greatest desire is that every brother and sister has a full realization, every family, every child. And if money gets in the way, then let's push it aside. We're here together. We can help each other. This is what the early church did. They shared. They encouraged. Folks, let's make this our priority before anything. There is, there's nothing more important than your, than your eternal salvation. Nothing. There's nothing more important than for our families than to, to raise our kids to accept Christ as Savior, to raise them to be free from the cultural lies of Satan, to have the helmet of salvation. You know, I know that some of our leaders are a little nervous because our offerings have gone down a little bit because of this pandemic. I respect their concerns. But I say praise God because it gives us a chance to fully rely on God in a way that we have not had to for so many years. We now can trust God fully. Let's trust Him together. Every sinful behavior is a result of refusing to accept how God created us to live in this world. You know, a few minutes ago I heard a man and a woman screaming at each other in the street. My heart cried out to God to save them and to take away the rejection of God that was causing this anger and division and this hatred between them. This week I had, I had a bad conversation with somebody over the phone. Somebody from the church. It was because of my stubbornness and wrong priorities. In the midst of it, we stopped and I cried out to God for forgiveness and ask for forgiveness for my brother. I had the wrong perspective. Adam was devoted to his wife Eve. That is not a bad thing. He was devoted to her. It was a good thing. But when that devotion caused him to reject the clear plan that God has for this world, his devotion turned to evil. He set aside salvation and was not protected from the attack. David was a man with sexual desires. That is not a bad thing. It became sin when he decided that God did not want him to have the lifestyle that he wanted. He did not trust God for the satisfaction of his sexual desires. He was king. He could make his own decisions just like all the other kings. He could have any woman in the kingdom he could have any fulfillment that he, that he possibly could want in his life. He stopped believing that God wanted him to be sexually fulfilled more than he did himself. Instead, he sexually dishonored a woman, stole a man's wife, and had him killed. This was not God's plan for David to fulfill his sexual desires. When I put on the helmet of salvation, it means that I have been saved from needing to express 
who I am. I am a new creature in Christ. I am a new creature in Christ. That is Christian before anything. Do you remember what we learned from Christopher Ewan last October? He did not come to our church to teach us how to be a homosexual Christian. He came to our church to teach us how to be a holy Christian. He is a homosexual who believes that God will fulfill his every desire because he has salvation. He trusts God in the way that God intended him to be. His struggle is not in how to live as a Christian who is gay. His struggle is that the world keeps telling him how they believe he should live as someone who is gay. His salvation, though, praise God, defines how he lives. That is the struggle. The world's perspective is Satan's perspective and and appeals to our, our sinful bodies. We need to be saved from ourselves. Satan does not want us to have salvation. Satan does not want us to share salvation. I think about the words that I say, the words that I write, the care that I give, the priorities that I live. What Will someone looking at my life be open to hearing about salvation? Take the helmet of salvation. Take the helmet of salvation. How does salvation change our lives on Monday? We have an eternal salvation which takes away the worries about this world. Salvation saves us from ourselves. We want a horse. We are not able to get a horse. But we think that a horse will make us happy. God does not provide the horse, and we question him. Instead, we share with God who we are as a person, and, 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 we need to, and why we think that a horse will make us happy. We, we share with him why we think that a horse will make us happy. We determine to trust God and not make the horse the driving force of our decisions. We say, God, this is why I want the horse. This is why I think it will make me happy. But I trust you. I trust you to fulfill that desire in the way that it needs to be fulfilled. The word horse could be replaced by so many words. House, husband, wife, child, career, respect, authority, vacations, normalcy. And the list goes on and on. Choose your own words. What describes what you no will make you happy. Then look at that word in the perspective of eternity. What has greater value, the horse or eternal salvation? Look at what you must do to achieve that horse. Does it require living in rejection of how God created you? Do you need to have a sexual relationship that goes against what God created? Do you have to work excessive hours giving up community? Do you have to give up a spiritual communication with God because you do not have the time? What is of greater value? The horse are fully experiencing Christ now. My friends, I am not saying the horse is not important. I am not saying that it was wrong for me to want a horse. I am saying that God knew that I did not need the horse to fulfill that desire. He knew that my eternal temporal salvation was better without one. I am not saying that you do not need a job, a career, wife, husband, kids, travel, or or that they're not important. I am saying that if any of those things become more precious to you than eternal salvation for yourself and others, then you will never be content. Because if anything else is more precious to you, it will pass away. Work is important. I have spent a lot of time working hard in in our building at the church. It was necessary. Now, 
It is time for others to take the load off of me. Buildings are a tool, but it will pass. Souls are eternal, and for the time that God has left for me at OCM, I am going to focus on the temporal and eternal salvation of others, to build up the body, to disciple believers, to share the hope of Christ, to equip my, my community, to be a Beyond Walls Church. My prayer for our Beyond Walls Church is that every person listening today will have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. If you don't know Him, if you've not accepted Him, please reach out to me so we can share the hope of Christ with you today. My prayer is that every person here will receive salvation and will take this helmet onto our heads to protect us for now and for eternity. We have been through so much these past few months. We have lost many things and people, but we have never lost hope. I want to leave you with a pat, the passage that Ava read so wonderfully this, at the beginning of the service today. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 6 through 9. Close your eyes. Just listen to me read. Consider these words carefully. In this, you greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible, and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Father God, I thank you and praise you for the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who has not accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray, God, that today will be their day of salvation. Let them reach out to me or to one of the brothers and sisters to understand how they can accept Jesus Christ as Savior and become a part of our Beyond Walls Church. I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters that every one of them will not just hold the helmet of salvation in their hand, but will place it on their head and that it will protect them now, today, that salvation will give them the hope and the perspective and the priorities that we need to have in our lives. I pray, God, that we will shine forth as your church to this world today. I pray this in your name. Amen.
morning, OCM. Please join your heart with mine as we receive God's blessing together. Let's pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. May we put on the helmet of salvation to know that our salvation only comes through the blood of the Lamb. It is only through the cross and your sacrifice that we are saved. It's not anything that we have done on our own. It's not anything that we can do, but only to believe and to have faith. Help us to trust in you, to know that you are good. Help us not to lean on the things of this world, but to know, Lord God, that you are in control. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below.
So as we close our service, don't leave. You know, it's interesting. I watched the, the numbers and it's, it's like 25, 30 people kind of disappear. Listen to the announcement just for a few moments. I want to make sure we're all together in the same community. You know, we, the helmet of salvation, it's a, it's a powerful study. I pre prepared a talk sheet and we've got a link there that you can go to. You can go to the website. It's very clearly there under English Ministries. Get that talk sheet. Get with some others. Share the questions with each other. Grow together as we talk about this helmet of salvation. You know, we also have a, a new life class. Um, it's really a, a Christian basic class. What, what we believe, why we believe. So far we have four people signed up. I want to encourage you to, to join us in that new life class. It's starting next week, next Sunday. Uh, if you just want to learn the basic thing, we have a couple people who have joined who actually are, are baptized. But they, they want to go back and just relook at what we believe. And, and I'm just, I'm really excited by this. Let's join together. I'd love to have 20 people join this class together. You know, we have registration for Sunday school, for children's Sunday school coming up, or today actually. We encourage you parents, we, we got a lot of great things planned for the kids. We want to encourage you and help you as parents to disciple kids in your home. Great resources there. But we need you to sign up because we need to be able to send the resources to you. So only those who sign up can we send the resources to. So please sign up today. You go to the website. It's very clear under the, under the children's ministry, uh, in the family ministries, and then go to the kids' ministry and just sign up today for the, uh, for the children's Sunday school. Uh, again, I'll remind you about the co-workers meeting coming up. I mentioned that before, and there's a link there and some information. Higher Heights is, is finished. We just praise God for the way God is. I just I want to thank those who have served faithfully in this ministry. I look forward to hearing how God is going to be working in these young people uh, in the future. I, I'm excited because there's some people in Hosanna Fellowship today that, that came to this church through Higher Heights. And I'm so thankful for this ministry. I just want to remind you again that we have the, the bulletin. And I send it out ahead of time, and it's also on the website. We put a link here in the, in the, uh, in the service. So please take a look at it. Keep, keep up with the announcements that we have. And after service, we're going to get together. We have a few people that like to get together and chat, and we just share with each other. We talk. Uh, sometimes it's interesting. We kind of are quiet for the first half hour, and then we go on for another hour and a half. So join us. It's just coming together just to talk about what Christ is doing in our lives and how he affects our world today. My friends, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for Beyond Walls Church that we will go and share the salvation of Christ with this world. Have a wonderful week. I don't see any kids, Miss Priscilla. Do you think they're out there? Oh, I think I see some kids and parents. Hi, parents and kids. I'm Gilly the Giraffe. And I'm Miss Priscilla. Some of you might recognize me from virtual summer day camp. This year has been one wild ride so far. It feels like everything we know as normal is not so normal anymore. You're right, Gilly. These lives that we built kind of fell apart like these blocks as we learned to wear masks, stay at home, and social distance. We know life is only going to get more wild as you prepare to go back to school. We know it won't be easy, so Miss Priscilla and I want you to know that we are here for you to cheer you on. We invite you to join our OCM Virtual Kids Club. That's right, OCM Virtual Kids Club is a community of kids just like you. Every week, we're going to learn a new lesson using an object that you already have at home. Each lesson will be a building block to help us build character and faith in Jesus. What do you mean by building character? Like characters in a book? No, no, Gilly. You are so silly. Do you see how I'm building these blocks to build this structure? Right? So the more blocks I add to this structure, the taller and stronger it gets. Just like this building, we need to build up our character by growing in different traits like patience and kindness and love. And that's going to help us be better followers of Jesus. 
Duh, that makes more sense. I'm pretty tall already, but I can't wait to build up my character. We will also have lots of fun activities like art, story times, and my personal favorite, science. Our virtual kids club will be online in a private Facebook group, just like we have our virtual summer day camp. That's right. The fall semester of kids club starts on September 11th and ends on December 31st. If you want to be part of OCM Virtual Kids Club, sign up by using our online registration form, which you can find on the OCM Church website. Registration begins tonight at 9 p.m. August 16th and will close on September 30th at 9 p.m. Our Kids Club is free for all families, but we are asking families to make a donation if possible to help support our awesome club leaders to get supplies and equipment to help make our club great. If you have any questions about how to join OCM Virtual Kids Club, email us at kidsclub at ocmchurch.org. I can't wait for you to join us at OCM Virtual Kids Club so that we can build and grow strong together. together. OCM Kids Club!